I'm Chandler Lorino, and I play Captain Xavier here on YouTube and in various other places. But today's story has nothing to do with Captain Xavier. Uh, you guys voted to hear the story of the world's largest dungeon, which was one of the first really big and serious D&D campaigns that I was ever involved in. Uh, and I wasn't playing Captain Xavier, I was playing a dwarven cleric. I don't remember his name, it was probably Theoborn. Some backstory. I, my earliest interactions with the concept of D&D was very, very young. My parents had first edition books, which I still have somewhere, I think. Um, and I thought it was a neat concept. Back in the days of Thacko, man. I know how Thacko works, and I can't... I, I don't know who came up with that. Uh, but I thought it was a neat idea. Um, I'd always liked um, the fantasy concept uh, with uh, because of Tolkien. Uh, I'd seen, I believe the, my first introduction was either one of the cartoons, one of the movies, either the, the, the Hobbit cartoon movie or the Lord of the Rings cartoon movie, uh, or the graphic novel, the Hobbit graphic novel. They had it in uh, the, the library when I was in fourth grade. But I think I'd seen it before. I, I want to say I'd seen the cartoons before then, but loved dwarves as a result. Because of the Hobbit and that, always liked dwarves. Uh, then, uh, in probably the, the 90s, at some point, we got a computer, and I got my hands on some of the Forgotten Realms computer games. Um, Temple Dark Moon and Eye, Eye of the Beholder, Temple Dark Moon, uh, which is uh, well, Eye of the Beholder 2, Temple Dark Moon. And there were a couple of others, but I particularly liked that one. And you got to make your own party. And it was very much built on the, the rules of D&D, &D because it was owned by TSR. Um... And uh, I built a party that was two dwarves and two, I think they were half-elves. Um, Theoborn and Theodred, um, Fingolfin and Eelrad, I think was all their names. I think that was their names. So, very definitely Lord of the Rings um, inspired. Uh, and I, I like playing dwarven clerics for some reason. Really liked Dwarven Clerics. And so when I got into D&D, the first time I ever played it was in, I think, high school. And it wasn't full, proper character sheet and all of that, because we didn't know what we were doing. Um, but I played a Dwarven Cleric, and I enjoyed him. Um, but being Dwarves had a, a low charisma stat, and so I decided to just go all in and make charisma his dump stat, and as a result, always play generally very gruff, very grumpy, very mean, rude Dwarven Clerics. Um, the first time when I played and I didn't do that, I didn't make him a complete jerk, uh, the GM decided that, that people, that my charisma, my low charisma score was the result of, uh, being very stinky. And so I had to roleplay that, which was fair. So I decided, okay, fine, I'll just play mean dwarves. Uh, and so it wasn't until college that my friend Joseph, who was, uh, one of the, the person who got me into D&D in the first place, who I first ever played it with, um, invited me to join a, a gaming, a D&D group that they were putting together. Uh, his sister wanted to run a campaign, and I think it was might, it was either her first or one of her earliest um, attempts to, to, to run a game as, the, as the, the Dungeon Master. And so she'd gotten this canned campaign, this pre-designed campaign called The World's Largest Dungeon, and it was like that thick, with all of the encounters, all of the monsters, all of the loot, all of the everything, all of the maps, all in this massive book, and you just went through it from cover to cover, and... Um, you went from level 1 to level 20 over the course of this adventure. Um, and the entire party, or the original party, I think, this was like 15 years ago, so a lot of this is very, very hazy to me. Uh, and we played a lot of campaigns, and I played a lot of Dwarven Clerics. Um, ultimately, each Dwarven Cleric was the son of the previous Dwarven Cleric. And uh, that, that was just... A fun ongoing gag uh, that they were all related. Their names always started with Theo, Theo something, because Theo means God, and they were always clerics, so Theo this, Theo that, yeah. Anyway, I thought it was clever. <laughs> um, yeah, so the original party, as far as I remember, there was me playing a dwarven cleric. Uh, my friend Joseph, I believe, started out as a wizard whose name is lost to time. 
Um, the Sergeant Major, Kyle, was playing, I want to say, a half-orc fighter? Question mark? And then we had a halfling rogue. It was played by Kestra. And one of the early en <laughs> encounters in this party cemented the nature of her and my friendship forevermore. Um... So we go into this dungeon together. We ended up picking up more people and we ended up losing somebody. Um, but by the time we ended the campaign, the only member of the original party that was still alive was my dwarf. Joseph went through six characters. Um, his bad luck started with the wizard. Early on in the campaign, we've entered this dungeon. I don't remember the, the story that got us into it. It was, there's this dungeon that you need to go do a thing in. Um, and uh, because it was a, a fully enclosed dungeon, you couldn't go to the store to buy stuff. All of your gear had to be acquired or found. The GM was encouraged to drop loot that was, you know, party useful, party specific. Um, but And we had a, a very diverse party, so we had a little bit of everything. Uh, as you should. Um, anyway, we get into this dungeon, and early on, in like the second room or something, we find everything looks like it's been looted and it's been completely gutted the first couple of floors. Uh, clearly, we are not the first people to get here. But we found a throne with a giant gem in it. Just sitting in a room. Very suspicious. Obviously a trap. We fell for it. Well, we didn't fall for it. Joseph fell for it. Um, his... Wizard, he, he was an impulsive fellow, Joseph, uh, and his wizard got bored, and while we're trying to figure out how to, to dig it out or get it out, he decides to try to bite it out. I don't know why, but he did. Uh, turns out, Jem was cursed. If you touched it, uh, you got cursed, and now every, anytime you were put into a stressful situation, like basically anytime you had to roll for initiative, you also had to then roll another die to see what you did. Sometimes you'd act normally, sometimes you'd attack the party, sometimes you'd run away, sometimes it would be random. Um, made for... Made, it made it difficult. Lord, did it make it difficult for him to be able to do anything. Uh, sometimes you'd just curl up on a ball and cry. Uh, and eventually, finally, we got to a high enough level that my cleric was able to remove the curse and free him of that. And in the very next fight, he died. And we were still like level three or something, so I couldn't bring him back from the dead. So he was dead. And he came, we, so he got to make a new character and he came back as a sorcerer. Uh, who I believe his familiar was actually a little flame elemental, which was neat. He died. I don't remember how. Um, so he came back as a bard, which I believe was his most successful character. At one point, he actually managed to bluff or diplomance an entire room full of Minotaurs into not fighting. And so he got full experience for that encounter, which helped him make up for the fact that he was several levels lower than us because he died three times already, at least. I might have these characters out of order. Again, I don't remember. Um, but we picked up another character. We picked up a Minotaur. A retarded Minotaur. And I don't mean that as, a, as an insult. I mean that by definition. Their intelligence was three. They were only barely capable of, uh, of human speech. And the person who was role-playing it played it really, really well. They were an outcast from their tribe because they were an idiot. Um, they had a giant squeaky axe. It still did all kinds of damage, but it squeaked when they hit people with it. They spoke with a lisp and were very, very dumb. And so much fun to have in the party. This um, was like... Why did we let this person in a party? Because it's a D&D campaign. Roll with it. Fair. Um, we then picked up another player. I think when, we, when Kyle ended up leaving due to a schedule conflict, uh, we ended up having to reschedule to another day, and he had to work that day, unfortunately. I think that's how it worked. Um, we picked up another player um, because the rogue had died. Kestra's rogue had died. Um, I, I don't remember how. Again, um, she also had some fairly poor luck. I remember we came to a, to a door, and she checked it for traps. And she informed us, there are no traps. Or I didn't find any traps. So we walked through the door, and we all get hit by the area of effect trap. 
<clears throat> my character being a, a schmuck, gave her grief. And I'm not entirely sure that she realized that it was my dwarf being a schmuck and not me being a schmuck. I'm not even sure that it was my dwarf being a schmuck and not me being a schmuck, if I'm quite honest. Uh, but we came to another door, and she checked it for traps. And she said, I don't find any traps. So my dwarf picked her up and hurled her through the door. Because she should guarantee her work. No traps went off. Um, and she called me a vulgar name that I cannot repeat on this channel because there are children watching. And uh, that pretty much cemented the nature of our friendship. Yeah. Yeah. Anytime I did something schmucking, schmuckery, schmuckish, with, a, with an air of schmuckitude, uh, that, that name would come back up. And deservedly so. Uh, so, yeah, I, I, I didn't like that her character died, and I think then the next person came in, and they were all, they just, they, they picked up the role of the rogue, though they didn't play a rogue so much as just a straight thief that just kept stealing from the party. Uh, but we didn't notice. We eventually noticed. I don't remember what we did. I think my dwarf had a, a long talk to her about, you know you can't buy healing potions in this dungeon, right? And if you should start bleeding, I'm the only one who can help you. Maybe stop stealing from the party. Um... At one point, Sergeant Major Kyle, his character liked throwing things. He was a fighter, but he very much liked throwing things. He had a bag of holding full of weapons. Javelins, axes. Just, he would open the encounter by just hurling all the weapons that he could at his opponent. Well, at one point, he pulled out, it was like a plus two axe of frost or something. It was a really, really nice weapon. Uh, and he hurled it at this bad guy, and it... Sunk, but it didn't quite kill him. And uh, they took a look at it, realized that is a really nice axe. I'm keeping it. And they took off running. <laughs> and he had to chase this creature down so that he could kill it and get his axe back. It was hilarious. Uh, but yeah, he ended up leaving. We picked up another rogue, played by Stephanie. Stephanie is now playing another rogue, Kestra. I want to say was playing a druid? Maybe? I could be getting it confused with another campaign. Um, uh, so we've got... No, what do we have so far? Where are we? We've got my Dwarven Cleric. We've got a new uh, Halfling Rogue. Pretty sure it was a Halfling Rogue. Um, a Minotaur Barbarian, I think. Um, the Half-Orc Fighter has left. Um, and... Joseph is playing, what, what was he up to at this point? I think he was now playing... No, he was still on the Bard, right. So the Bard did the diplomancing with the, uh, the Minotaur, and that's how we ended up with Francis. Um, in exchange for not killing us all, we had to take Francis, the retarded Minotaur, with us. Um, so we did. Moved on to the next, next encounter was some kind of cryohydra. A hydra that breathed ice or some such. Uh, and the, the bard decided to be sneaky and made himself invisible and was going around planting jars of um, flaming oil around it so that we can then ignite them all and burn the thing because that was its weakness because it was a cryohydra and all of that. Um, and apparently the cryohydra saw the jars appearing and eventually figured out something's leaving those and according to the pattern they're there. Nom. Uh, and, uh, killed him. Murdered him outright. Was his best character I think he ever played. One of the best characters he ever played. So he came back as a ranger. Um, and, uh, from the time he finished rolling up the character. So he's, he's got his character sheet, he creates this, this ranger. From the time he finished rolling up the character sheet to the time that the character was dead was five minutes of real time. On the clock. So we came into a room, found a ranger. It's D&D, &D, so... You look trustworthy! Would you like to join our noble quest? Why, yes, yes I would. Alright, let's go fight the monsters in this room! Kick in the door! He charges in! He gets surrounded by shadows, they drain him, and he dies in round one. Just dead. I was just like... I... We then killed the shadows. We kept having dark mantles drop on our head. I remember that being a thing, just over and over. Every time we'd go into a room, dark mantle. We'd never remembered to check. 
And by the time we started remembering to check, we had left the part of the dungeon where they were. But the entire party remained incredibly paranoid. Anytime we went into a room, what, what the fuck? What? Watching you. Um, we also eventually worked out that we just have the, the, the dwarf go in because I was a cleric. I had inflict. Dark metal drops on my head. Inflict. It dies. We move on. Um, really didn't have to make an attack roll on something that's attached to your face. Am I touching it? Yeah. Then I inflict wounds. I um, think that dwarf also had a spiked gauntlet. So he punch himself in the head with a spiked gauntlet where there's a mantle on his head. And we decided that wasn't such a good plan. Um, hilarious, but not a good plan. Anywho. Ranger dead. So he comes back as a, a paladin. And I think he came back as a paladin of the same god that my character worshipped, which I think was St. Cuthbert. I could be wrong about that. I'm pretty sure it was St. Cuthbert. Um, so he came back with a paladin of that. Again, we met him. Hello, would you like to join our noble class? Why, well, yes, yes I would. And I see you favor Cuthbert. Well done! Yeah. <laughs> Dwarves, Cuthbert! <laughs> we then went into the next room, ran into a four group of four minotaurs. He decides to tumble through the minotaurs to get to behind them so that he can flank them, but ends up failing his um, tumble check, gets hit. No, he, he makes the tumble check enough to get through them but does still, I think, incur attacks of opportunity. Or at the very least, he's now on the far side of the room fighting two Minotaurs while the whole rest of the party is fighting the remaining two Minotaurs. They murder him, and then we murder the rest of them. Another character down. Is that five now? Are we, is, that, is that five? Wizard, Sorcerer, Ranger, Bard, Paladin. Yeah, five. Uh, <laughs> at this point, we've picked up another new player. Um, Shannon was playing a monk. Which, given that she joined the group through Joseph's sister, because they were both in the same Kyokushin dojo, they were both black belts in Kyokushin, it was very fitting that she chose to play a monk who punches people in the head to death. Um, so that was, that was fun. But we've definitely reached the point where the only member of the original party still alive is my dwarf. And he's getting a little, a little cracked. About it. Like, meet someone new. Like, lovely. I wonder how long you'll last. Five minutes? Ten minutes? Nice to meet you. I don't need to know your name. Not gonna... We don't bother to put it on your grave anyway. Um, yeah, he, he was... Uh-huh. He was a little bit... A little bit cracked. Um, and that was more or less where the campaign left off. Um, Joseph then came back as a dwarven barbarian. Because the only thing harder to kill than a Dwarven Cleric is a Dwarven Barbarian. He had more hit points than, I think, two or three other members of the party. Um, and then we ended up moving on to another campaign before we got to, to see how that played out. I don't remember how high of a level we got. Not all that high. Um, I know the monk had just picked up a really cool monk-specific item. A belt of some kind that was the, the ultimate monk weapon. And she was bummed that she never got to punch anyone in the face with it while wearing it. Um, in the end, and this was, like, like I said, since I always, in late, we then moved on to other campaigns, and I always, almost always played a Dwarven Cleric. I sometimes played a Human Fighter, at which point I was basically playing myself. Um, but with the Dwarven Clerics, I don't know what you, what you mean, I'm Dwarvy. Um, the Dwarven Clerics were all the son of the previous Dwarven Cleric, which means he had either had kids before he went into the dungeon, or he lived and come and survived somehow, had made it out. And we decided that the, the official ruling was that he had, one, he had had kids when he went in, but he had also made it out. Because in, a, in, a, in, a, in the next campaign, I was playing his son, and Kestra decided to play his daughter in one of the campaigns. Uh, and so we had a wonderful sibling rivalry going on, which that'll be on the list of the next stories. Was I think that was... Ravenloft. Um, there were some hilarious hijinks that went down with the brother-sister pair because mom liked the sister, dad liked me. We both were pretty sure that dad came out of that dungeon crazy. And by the end of the Ravenloft campaign, we didn't think he was crazy anymore. So, yeah, he made it, he made it out. And then in a completely later campaign, the person who had played Francis, Lynette, had moved away, had gone away, but then came back for a one-shot or was, was around for a couple of days of an adventure. Um, it might have been a one-shot, but she didn't want to make a whole new character. She wanted to play Francis again. 
And since it was a one-shot campaign and she wasn't going to be there for the rest, we're like, yeah, sure, we'll put it in an encounter involving Francis in, in, in the, the first the first session when all the characters get brought together. And it was a weird way for them to all get brought together. That was a uh, free port. There were, there were guns and so forth. I was playing a Dwarven Cleric, son of the previous Dwarven Cleric, brother to the other two Dwarven Clerics. It, it, the, the, he, was a, he was a virile man, the Theoborn. Uh, he had many children, which is unusual for a dwarf. Anyway, Francis showed up in that campaign, uh, and that campaign also got a little weird. I mean, all our campaigns got weird. It's D&D, of course they got weird. Uh, but that one involved things like a, um, an albino gobbleope, and uh, pulling a canoe out of my shield. Those kinds of things. Um, yeah, but Francis came back temporarily uh, and recognized that my character had to have been related to the previous one and was very confused and afraid and sad. Uh, but it worked out well in the end. Um, so yeah, that was the world's largest dungeon. We never did go back and finish it. Which is kind of a shame because it was, it was neat. There were some fun puzzles and stuff. I don't remember most of them. I know there was one where it was, in fact, a... a a maze that keeps teleporting the group around. And we didn't know that. We hadn't picked up on that little trick. That was something that happened in Temple Dark Moon. You'd be going down a hallway, and it would keep teleporting you to the beginning of the hallway, and so it would seem like the hallway was endless, when in fact you were just going over the same 20 feet over and over again. And you, you couldn't figure this out unless you dropped something and then... Ha! Huh! And then there was a little button on the, on the side of one of the walls, and if you're paying close attention you could see it, and you'd turn towards it and poke it, and then... It would disable and stuff like that. And it was similar to that, where we kept getting teleported around. And we were pretty sure that uh, the GM just, or the DM just didn't know how to draw maps. We were very confused because we had a couple people in the party who loved doing the maps and keeping it all, keeping the records and all of that, and their map just wasn't lining up with what was going on. And they were very upset. Uh, but yeah, it turned out every time we took, came around a corner and we teleported somewhere else entirely, so the map just did not work. Um, there were some fun things like that. It was fun. It worked out well. It definitely got us all familiar with the game, got, got us you know, familiar with how we liked playing, got to know each other, uh, each other's play styles. Uh, we switched campaigns, we switched GMs. Uh, Joseph would, would GM, uh, DM, and I, I feel he was a far better DM than he was a player. Uh, I don't know if he would agree with that, but I felt that that was the case. Um, he was a lot better at uh, improvisation and making things up on the fly, um, when he didn't, well, when, when, when that was what was needed. So he was an excellent, excellent DM. Um, his sister, Katie, would also DM occasionally. And eventually, um, Stephanie decided she wanted to DM. And she was actually also a, an excellent DM, I thought. Um, that, there were some mm, weird campaigns involving dwarven clerics there. Uh, had one that accidentally ended up with a pet swarm of hell wasps. That was terrifying. All right, I think I think that's it for the world's largest dungeon. Uh, the highlight really was that Joseph went through six characters. Who knows how many he would have gone through by the end? Uh, for all we know, that dwarven barbarian might have survived. But it was it was determined that nobody else made it out. That my dwarf was the only one who made it out of that dungeon. Francis got taken out, made it out in a completely different manner. You'd have to we'll have to, you'd have you'll have to vote for the Newport campaign, the Freeport campaign. Um, if you want to hear how Francis got out of the dungeon. Um, but I'm going to carry on with, with the D&D stuff. I'm enjoying this. I haven't thought about a lot of these stories in a long time. So the three options for next time are all going to be D&D. You're just going to have to come to grips with that. Uh, we've got the Freeport campaign, the return of Francis, and um, another son of Theoborn. I'd have to look up his name. Theo Bain. That one was Theo Bain because he, he was an agnostic cleric. So yeah, that was a fun one. Um, the Raven... Raven Guard? Raven Hill? Ravenloft. Ravenloft. The Ravenloft campaign with the brother and sister and their wonderful rivalry and how they learned that dad wasn't crazy. And finally, I'm going to put this one back on there because this is still my favorite campaign ever, The Witch Queen. And his adventures. Oh yes! His adventures. The adventures of the Witch Queen. 
and all that that entailed. So there you go. Pick which one of those D&D stories you want to hear about next time, and I will bring it up. Uh, some of them I even have visual aids for, but most I don't. All right. Thank you for watching. <laughs>